In this video, we're going to learn about the compatibility of or incompatibility of several fertilizers or chemicals. Uh, we're going to go through demonstrating mixing concentrated chemicals. We're going to do a jar test and explain why that's important. And then we'll follow that up with some field applications showing you some issues that we've seen in the field as well as some best practices. Let's start by looking at chapter 11 in the book. You can find a link to the book below in the, in the description. If you look in that chapter, you will see that we have a compatibility table. This compatibility table shows what chemicals are compatible when mixing and which ones are not. Today we're going to be looking at a few different chemicals to see how they react. As you can see from this table, we're going to be mixing combinations of the following chemicals together to test for compatibility and incompatibility. The first one that we're going to be testing today is urea ammonium nitrate or UAN32. Then we're going to be looking at ammonium polyphosphate, ammonium nitrate, AN20, urea sulfuric acid, which is in furic, calcium ammonium nitrate, CAN17, and then urea. So we'll mix these together and we'll see what we find. So here's the first two fertilizers that we'll be mixing together. Remember that these are concentrated fertilizers mixed at about 50-50. After about 30 minutes, we'll inspect each of the fertilizer mixtures to see what they look like. All right, before we look at the result of our mixture, let's look and see how it looks on the chart in the book. So we mixed UAN32, which is product number five, with ammonium polyphosphate, which is product number 10. So if we look here on the chart, what you'll see is product number 5 and number 10, when mixed together, says it's compatible. Let's compare the table with what we got here. After letting them sit for about 30 minutes, you will notice that there was some gelling, some sliminess that kind of formed between these two products. Uh, the reason why this might happen is because some of the additives in these particular fertilizers might have been different than the additives that were in the fertilizers that were tested in the book. Now we're just going to continue mixing products together and making observations of what we see. And in the end, we'll pull up a table on what we find in terms of what's compatible and incompatible.
All right, here's a very simple explanation of the results that we got. And X means that it's not compatible, and OK means that it, we found that it is compatible. Let's talk about why we don't want to mix these concentrated fertilizers together. There's two reasons, really. One is that uh, often they will use the same tank to, uh, to hold different fertilizers, and the residue from those fertilizers in those tanks can combine together. And the second is, is that you don't want to have these two chemicals coming into the same hose or into the same uh, proximity in a pipeline because they may also bond together there as well. Let's go through a few photos that show these issues. This is an example of a tank that um, you can see here based on the date they put different formulas in the tank over time. And after in putting filling this tank with these different fertilizers, eventually you ended up with a cake at the bottom of the tank. Uh, this photo now shows that the the caking effect of these chemicals, um, you know, combining together and dropping out as a precipitate in the bottom of the tank. So to prevent the caking in the bottom of the tanks, it's best to have one tank for each chemical. This photo shows how there are at least three different tanks there and each tank has its own chemical. The way this particular system is set up is that the truck would pull up and they would inject into one of those three ports there labeled one, two, and three which has the same number as the tank. So if they were injecting UAN32 that would go into the first tank and they would just inject it or pump it into that tank through port number one there from the outside. Here's an example of two tanks feeding into a common line and if those two fertilizers are the same in each tank, then no problem. But if, uh, if those fertilizers are different, then there's going to be a problem. Here's an example of several fertilizer ports being injected in close proximity into the irrigation line. This has the, a problem in that the chemicals could still be, be incompatible and combine and precipitate out as something that would then plug up the irrigation system. Here's another example of fertilizers being combined before being injected. And in addition, they're also close together, which can cause incompatibility issues. So the best practice is to have individual fertilizer tanks with individual lines going into individual ports that are spread out far apart on the irrigation line. So that way it has a chance to mix with the water and become diluted. So that way you don't have the incompatibility issues. Now that you understand that there's incompatibility issues between various chemicals or fertilizers, you can also have incompatibility issues with the irrigation water itself. Sometimes irrigation water has some calcium in it that the fertilizers may uh, interact with. These are a couple photos here of uh, problems that have been noticed uh, in the irrigation water after the fertilizers were added. The way you prevent these types of problems is by doing a jar test. So we're going to do a jar test next to determine if we may have a potential problem. So remember, a jar test is important to make sure that we're not going to have any incompatibility issues. So here we are today at a pump station. This particular pump station is fed by reservoir water. And so we're going to get a sample of that water that it could be used. So we just saw that mixing fertilizers together uh, directly causes some reactions. But one of the other things you need to check is that you don't get reactions with your irrigation water. So the way you do that is you do a jar test. So we've got some of our irrigation water that we took from our uh, field. And now we're going to add a little bit of enfuric to it, which is the pink stuff there on the right. We're going to put this in at the concentrations that we would put it in uh, that we were wanting to inject in the field to achieve a certain pH. That does also have a little bit of nitrogen in it. And then we're also going to add a little bit of uh, ammonium polyphosphate here so we can get a little bit more nitrogen as well as the phosphorus that we're after. So once you get it in there in the concentrations you want, now we got to get the lid on tight and shake it up. And this will allow us to see if we're going to have any reactions with our irrigation water. So you want to let this sit for at least a few hours, you know, so you can see if anything forms with time. All right, here we are. We're back at looking at our jar. And if you notice, you might be able to see a little bit of, uh, of cloudiness at the bottom of our jar here, down in this area. 
you can probably see the precipitation, the cloudiness moving around inside of the jar. That would likely cause plugging of drip systems. All right, here we are looking at our jar test about two hours later. Remember, we mix this with our concentrations that we plan to add to the field. You'll notice that some of that precipitate that was down here floating around earlier, right after we had uh, shaken up the bottle, has now floated up to the surface. It's a little hard to see here, but we've got a pretty good amount floating up on the surface. If we look up here, let's try to stir it with a straw. Maybe we can see it a little bit as it moves around there so you can see it floating around this would likely cause some plugging with time in a drip system now that you can see the results from our jar test this explains why it's always best practice to inject upstream of the filters the, really the only thing that should be injected downstream of the filters are pesticides and strong acids everything else should be injected upstream because you just never know when there's going to be an issue with uh, incompatibility of fertilizers or incompatibility with your irrigation water. And so injecting upstream of the filters is the best option. Now it is common that a lot of people inject downstream, you know, but, and really the reason for that is because they don't want uh, to worry about having to turn off the injection for back flushing. But really it takes two minutes, as you can see from one of our other videos, it only takes about two minutes to clear out the, the filters of that chemical so you can go into back flush. So highly recommend that you inject upstream of the filters. One other note here to mention is, is that sometimes when you're injecting fertilizers uh, and you're using mag magnetic meters, those, uh, the fertilizer can affect the results or the accuracy of the magnetic meters. So just keep that in mind whenever you're uh, planning on finding a location to inject your fertilizers. For more details on incompatibility issues, check out the link with the book in the description. And also check out our other videos on fertigation. Thanks for watching.